Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Conservation Alliance Breakfast at Outdoor Retailer. I'm Brady Robinson, the Executive Director of the Conservation Alliance, and I'm coming to you today from the North Woods of Minnesota, right off the shore of Lake Superior. Wherever you're joining us from today, we hope that, as always, you arrive tired and leave inspired. We're going to be talking about the Boundary Waters Canoe Area this morning and the efforts to save it from a uh, terrible copper mine. And we've got some great speakers for you, Alex Falconer, Claire Gallagher, and Joseph Goldstein. So uh, before we get started with the presentation, I just have a few words for you. Uh, as you know, the mission of the Conservation Alliance is to harness the collective power of business and outdoor communities to fund and advocate for the protection of North America's wild places. We are a coalition of business and business members, and we would be nothing without our member companies support. And we've, we're welcoming some new members this morning. We have Ableist CBD, Cloud9, Devil's Foot, Exact Change, Festi Asheville, Charleston, and Charlottesville, Go RVing, Hapsi, Hike and Bike, Ibex, Kirk's Outdoor Store, Portside Productions, Public Lands, Straight Grain Supply, Swell Skateboards, Tread Labs, Upslope Brewing, and Woodbridge. We also have Pinnacle members. Those are companies who give $100,000 and above every year to support the Conservation Alliance. Our Pinnacle members include Bank of the West, Merrill, Patagonia, REI, Keen, The North Face, and our newest public uh, Pinnacle member, Public Lands. Thank you to all of our members for your support. If you work for a company who is not yet a member of the Conservation Alliance, we certainly hope that you would consider joining us. If you're interested in joining, please reach out to Connor Maclier at Connor at conservationalliance.com. A few little news items from the Conservation Alliance for you. We've got an expanded team, the biggest team we've ever had in the history of the Alliance. Joining me, Josie Norris, Connor Maclier, and Abby Becker are Allie Hartz and Allie Kazukian who make up our communications team. Yes, we have a communications team made up of Allie and Allie at the Conservation Alliance. Also joining us is Shorin Brown, our brand new government affairs and advocacy director. He's in his second week at the Alliance and uh, I have no doubt we'll be making huge contributions to our work in government affairs and advocacy. We've got a few other things we're working on a lot actually, but I'll just mention a few today. We are working on a grant program, uh, a new element of our grant program as a function of our justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion work. This program is going to intentionally connect with the diversity of groups doing conservation work in North America. You'll be hearing more about it from us, member companies you can expect to hear from us, maybe you already have, and we hope to have something to announce this fall. Also, with Shorin joining the team, you're going to be seeing more offerings, more work in policy and advocacy. And with a communications team of two, you should see some beautiful visuals and stories. And uh, we're going to be showing up in places that perhaps you haven't seen us. I don't know how many of you saw our ad with Pacifico uh, during the Olympics. Um, but anyway, we're going to, you're going to see more of us as we work to expand not only within the outdoor industry, but in other industries as well. And finally, please remember uh, that our summer uh, 2021 ballot is open. What does that mean? Well, all grantees, everyone who receives a grant through the Conservation Alliance is nominated by one of our member companies. And then uh, we work through and the best nominees go onto a ballot, the staff put some of those onto a ballot, which are then voted on by the members. So that ballot is open. If you have not yet voted, please do so. So as I mentioned, I'm here in the North Woods of Minnesota. I grew up in Minnesota. I am a Minnesotan, a Midwesterner, proud uh, Midwesterner. And some of my very first experiences in the outdoors were in a canoe. My dad took me paddling in the lakes and rivers uh, of Minnesota. And my first wilderness experience of my life was in the Boundary Waters canoe area sometime in uh, probably the early 1980s. There's me looking sullen uh, on the right. 
Uh, and that on the left is me, I think probably sometime in junior high school, uh, getting ready for uh, a Boundary Waters canoe trip with my dad. The technology and the gear has certainly improved over the years. Those Grumman uh, canoes weighed around, I don't know, 50 pounds. And it was definitely a clean and jerk to get that thing up on your shoulders. Uh, the gear is a lot lighter, but the experiences haven't changed. And it's fair to say that those early experiences in the Boundary Waters Canoe area helped to shape who I am, what I chose to do with my career and what I chose to do with my free time as an adult. And I have to say that I think this particular wilderness area is one of the least known and most unheralded in the wilderness system in the United States. But I won't uh, go further. I'll let Alex Falconer uh, explain this to you. Alex Falconer is the government affairs director for the campaign to save the Boundary Waters. The campaign to save the Boundary Waters, incidentally, was the recipient of one of the first ever multi-year grants that we announced in February. So your membership dollars are going to support this campaign. Alex was the first known person to run the Boundary Waters Traverse, which is a 110 mile trail uh, through the heart of the Boundary Waters canoe area, a trail in an area known for its canoeing. So you can imagine what that might have been like. And he did all this to advocate for its protection. So thank you so much, Alex, for joining us this morning. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Brady, for the introduction and welcoming us for the annual breakfast here. Um, all right. Well, again, thank you. I want to thank everybody for tuning in, for watching today, uh, no matter where you are. I mean, it's so easy to say no, and you guys all showed up. So it means a lot that you're here. Uh, you're going to learn about the Boundary Waters, what makes this place so incredibly special, uh, the threat it currently faces from the potential for sulfate or copper mining. And then we're going to get into how we can save this place. Um, uh, and hopefully you'll be able to join us in that effort. Uh, before we get started here, I just want to acknowledge that the, Ashen, uh, the Anishinaabe people, uh, also known in this region as Chippewa or Ojibwe, have lived in the area of the Boundary Waters for countless generations and have a deep connection uh, and relationship with these lands and waters. Indigenous people continue to harvest wild rice in the Boundary Waters region and maintain treaty rights to hunt, fish, and gather. As sovereign nations, tribes play a central role in protecting this place and have called for the protection of the Boundary Waters. So as we reflect on that, it's also early in the morning. Uh, I just wanted to let you know what a Boundary Waters sunrise looks like. So this is early in the morning, just as the sun was coming up, the air temperature is cooler than the water temperature, it creates this just really cool uh, and kind of mystic uh, steam lake effect. And so just captured a little bit of that that I wanted to share with you all. All right, if there's any birders out there, that was the white-throated sparrow uh, that was doing the call. Anyway, uh, so here we are. It's the, this is the, the Boundary Waters. This is part of the greater uh, about 4 million acre Quetico Superior ecosystem. So what we have is the Boundary Waters, which is fully within the Superior National Forest in Northern Minnesota. Uh, across the border in Canada is the Quetico Provincial Park in Ontario, which is also managed as a wilderness. And then to the Northwest of the Boundary Waters is Boisers National Park. And these three protected landscapes uh, form the Quetico Superior um, area, all of which is under threat from proposals for sulfate or copper mining. Um, this image really does a great job of illustrating what this place is all about. Uh, photographer Jim Brandenburg took this aerial photo. Uh, this is the top of the Moose Lake uh, chain of lakes. Um, right here is Horseshoe Island, kind of this iconic spot. There's uh, an amazing campsite right there. Uh, there's another one on the other side. Also kind of happenstance caught a couple canoeists in this lake here. There's not a site, a campsite there. I'm assuming they're fishing. So hopefully they caught dinner. Um, and then the other thing that's really illustrates is that the lakes here are all interconnected. I characterize this as more of an inland sea interrupted by land here and there, just by the fact that all the water is connected. You've got these lakes that, that run into one another via waterfalls or rivers or streams, um, uh, bogs and marshes, it's all interconnected. And so as we'll discuss in a little bit, if you have this massive point source of pollution uh, from a sulfuric copper mine, which would generate sulfuric acid 
in acid mine drainage that would diffuse into the water, it would literally just spread in an incontrollable way and would, would, would flow into the boundary waters. Um, the other thing that is kind of keep in mind here is that water, this may shock some people, probably not, is that water doesn't adhere by artificial lines on a map. You can have a wilderness border, but you could pollute outside of it. Water is going to run into the wilderness. Um, for example, right here, this is the international boundary. Canada starts right here. You can see my cursor circling it. Um, this is the Prairie Portage, where if you're in the boundary waters, you want to cross into the Quetico. You have to check in with the ranger stations nearby and, uh, and go on your way. Um, so there's no dotted line on this picture delineating the border. And the water also doesn't really care. Um, this is a little bit more zoomed in. Uh, some drone footage. This is right next to the potential mine site itself. You can see this is the boreal forest. We've got these golden orange tamaracks, uh, this old growth, uh, red and white pines that kind of stand as sentinels watching over the forest. Some of them are two, three hundred years old. Uh, and then as we kind of keep going along here, you can really see the water resource that is what we're trying to protect. Uh, important note, no drones in the wilderness. So if anybody from the Forest Service is watching, we're cool. Um, here's just an idea of some of the activities you can do when you're out there. Uh, right here, I've got my tent set up, uh, ready for sunset. You've got these, perf these picture perfect glassy calm lakes that reflect the sky and the trees and the sunset. Um, the, the fishing is unparalleled, bass, uh, walleye, pike, and lake trout. Minnesota actually has the most lake trout lakes outside of Alaska uh, within the United States. And then just an idea of, of you got the canoeists here, when you throw everything in a canoe, paddle out, find your site. Um, and then there's winter activities too. So you have dog sledding, backcountry, cross country skiing, ice fishing, winter camping. Uh, it's just absolutely beautiful. You can do things in all seasons. Um, and just to give you an idea of, of what it looks like. So you float off in a canoe and you get from lake to lake, you, have, you throw your gear on your shoulder, put uh, hike your canoe up on your shoulders, uh, on your shoulders and then cross the path. So here's this kind of a time lapse of a, of a portage we took. There's our daughter walking back to get some more gear, our boys, some dogs. So then you find your lake and you're able to just float off and hopefully you find your campsite before it gets dark. And then the, wild, the wildlife here. So we have loons, river otters, this is a grouse, of grouse. Black bear, and I got all these all these pictures on my on my iPhone. Uh, here's a wolf that was chasing a deer across a frozen lake. This giant snapping turtle, and then finishing out with a moose that <laughs> on one of my runs through the boundary waters uh, stared me down on trail for about five minutes. I wasn't going to go near it, and it was more interested in this lady friend that crossed a little bit ahead. So it kept on going and leaving me to keep on running. Um, the boundary waters is also uh, named an International Dark Sky Sanctuary, one of only 14 places in the world um, that has this designation. So it's one of the darkest skies you can possibly find to see the night sky, the Milky Way. And if you're lucky enough to catch the Northern Lights as I was able to just this past March. And all this, all that is under threat. The wildlife, the water, the scenery, the, the lights from uh, potential for sulfur or copper mining. So this is going to show you Kind of where the boundary waters are situated and we're going to zoom in here so there we have the boundary waters and here are this is the proposed mining site so these the red kind of squarish areas are the mineral leases that anafagasta holds as they try to propose to build a massive sulfate or copper mining district right on the edge of the boundary waters all this water in this part of the state flows north and so we have the water that flows right by the mine site hooks north and flows into the wilderness, into the Quetico, into Voyagers National Park. All that water eventually hooks and flows out of Hudson Bay. It's how it flows here. Um, demonstrating kind of the, the, the threat that we face here. Sulfate or copper mining has never been done in Minnesota before, uh, primarily because of the inherent risk to water. Um, sulfate or copper mining as a part of the hard rock industry is, is the EPA's most toxic industry in the country, leaving the most super funds in its wake. Um, and it has a 100% track record of polluting nearby surface and groundwater. If you go back to basic chemistry class, you introduce sulfates and sulfides into air and water in Minnesota, it rains 
and it snows a lot. So you're going to have constant moisture seeping in and leaching out sulfuric acid from the mine site into the boundary waters area. Um, and the, all that is under just normal operating procedure. There's, of course, the potential for uh, catastrophic, catastrophic disasters. So the kind of the greenest slide here is 2014 when the Mount Pauli mine uh, tailings dam collapsed. You know, you have to build these dams to hold back the water that's falling on the mine site and the waste rock to keep that polluted water from entering the ecosystem. That one, that one uh, collapsed in, a, in an operating mine. Um, we have the Gold King mine in Colorado that it had been closed for decades and the government was trying to figure out how to keep treating the water uh, and the, the dam collapsed there and flooded the Animus River and, and got into the ecosystem there too. So um, these, are, these are the worst case scenario uh, in addition to just the normal everyday seepage that a mine like this would produce. So in comes the Boundary Waters, um, Save the Boundary Waters. We are a coalition of over 400 conservation organizations, businesses, other groups and associations uh, with a singular goal of banning sulfide or copper mining from the watershed of the Boundary Waters. Um, Joseph in a little bit is going to talk from the kids for the Boundary Waters perspective. Uh, we of course have the tremendous support and help of the Conservation Alliance, which has really been a part of our coalition since the beginning. And then we've got our Boundary Waters Business Coalition, which since it's kind of a business crowd, I'm going to dive into the economics here just a little bit. Um, the northern northeastern Minnesota is home to a nearly billion dollar a year uh, ac uh, economic uh, activity due to the outdoor recreation and amenities based economy, supporting over 17,000 jobs. And the Boundary Waters itself has over 160,000, a little bit outdated, 160,000 visitors annually, which makes the Boundary Waters America's most visited wilderness. And this is what drives the economy. Uh, you might not be able to tell, but this is an economic engine right here. Um, and unfortunately, also the site of the massive self potential for the sulfide or copper mining in the upper right quadrant of the screen. So take this, what is now the, the Superior National Forest, scalp it off and envision uh, rock crushing plants in addition to the giant holes in the ground, the ventilation shafts, the transportation corridors, there'd be, new, there'd be railroads, there'd be lights, there'd be 24 hour uh, semi trucks hauling rock in and out. Um, so you're gonna turn what this is into a mining district and day one right here, we got a third generation resort out of business. People don't want to recreate next to a mine site. Um, all along the shoreline here are people's homes, their cabins, their fish camps, their hunting properties. People don't want to hunt or live next to a mine site. And up here, Voyager's um, Outward Bound School, one of their one of their main uh, bases of operation, uh, servicing hundreds, if not thousands, of people, uh, bringing them into the wilderness. You know, kids, veterans, people with disabilities, they're shut down on day one as well. So we've got on the path of pollution from the mine site where the water re-enters the wilderness, there's 30 businesses, but also if taking the macro view of this region in general, um, a mine site would, would cost up to $100 million in annual income, in addition to the nearly 5,000 jobs that would, that would be lost. So a uh, mine in this area is a, is a depressed um, economy comparatively to leaving this place intact and as pristine as, as it is today. So I'll give one plug and one CTA. Uh, Brady's going to go through another uh, call to action. But if you are in the position to sign up your business for our Boundary Waters Coalition, um, Business Coalition, please let me know. Uh, easy address to remember, alex at savetheboundarywaters.org. Um, we'll, we'll keep you, we'll, you'll lend your name to our website demonstrating the, the breadth of business support across the country, uh, as well as in Minnesota. Uh, we'll keep you updated on what's happening. We have calls to action. We've had letters to sign to Congress. Uh, we do a shop to support program where we feature uh, businesses that support us as a way to you know, return the favor. Um, and there's a lot of other creative things we can do uh, uh, in partnership. So please uh, consider joining our coalition. And last, public opinion is on the side of protecting the boundary waters. In Minnesota, the vast majority of people in every single congressional district are opposed to this project, including the 8th Congressional District, where this would be uh, located. You know, the mining companies uh, like to come in and talk about the, the panacea, uh, you know, fix up, uh, just provide all these jobs and, and income um, to the area. But as we discussed, it's actually an underwater proposition. Uh, and even so, as more people have learned about it, uh, the, the residents within the area um, majority do not want this mine as well. Um, so, we're going to go through the federal withdrawal process. So now we're getting into how we're going to win. It's kind of like the third movie of a Star Wars trilogy. You know, we've had some bad stuff happen. Now the, the young scrappy upstart uh, 
it's going to take on the, the international mining company. Um, so what we have here is the federal withdrawal process, which the direct analogy is what's going on with the Grand Canyon. It was the potential for uranium mining right outside the Grand Canyon. And in 2012, Interior Secretary Salazar issued a 20 year um, moratorium on issuing any new mining leases to companies, uh, given the fact that uranium and water aren't a great mixture, uh, particularly when it comes into protecting the Grand Canyon. That's exactly what we're asking for here. Just switch out Boundary Waters for Grand Canyon, sulfur our copper mining for uranium mining, and it's what we're trying to achieve. So the federal government can stop this process for up to 20 years, uh, which would allow a bill through Congress to be passed to make it permanent. And we have that bill currently right now. HR 2794 was introduced by Representative Betty McCollum earlier this year, actually on Earth Day, quite fitting. We have 45 co-sponsors to date, and we'd really like, and Brady's gonna walk you, how to, walk you through how to do this, but we'd really love for you to contact a representative today and ask them to support her bill. Um, one of my favorite parts of the job is bringing people's voices to those that have decision-making power. And so uh, we do a really good job at elevating the, the constituent voices, business voices, public health, everything that would go into account when you, when you think about what this mine would mean to the area. So right here we have Roberto, one of our organizers on the team who uh, organized four constituents to meet with Representative Pocan's office from Wisconsin. Uh, they described their love for this area and got him on board. He signed on as a co-sponsor. And this last week, uh, I was on a call with Nate Tachek, a Patagonia employee, um, with Representative Brownlee, who represents Ventura, which is Patagonia's headquarters uh, in California. And he did this great job of talking about how he's from Wisconsin, goes to the Boundary Wars every year, but also making the case that this is something that Patagonia as a company has been behind for close to six or seven years now. And this is something they really want protected. And really the combination of a passionate uh, constituent along with the business angle got her, got her on board. And she told us in that meeting that she was gonna join on as a, as a co-sponsor and she did. Within 24 hours, her name was on the bill. So it really makes a difference. If you would like to set up a meeting like this, I can get you connected with the office. We can go through it. I'll take care of all the logistics. You just bring your passion. Um, I'm gonna go into a little bit of adventure advocacy, which gets into my project that, that Brady teased a little bit. I don't know if we coined this term, but I'll just claim that we did. Um, we have a culture of supporting people that wanna take a unique twist on advocacy for the Boundary Wires, so we call it adventure advocacy. A couple of highlights previously are Dave and Amy Freeman, who spent an entire year in the Boundary Waters on one permit. They stayed for an entire year and drew awareness to, to the issue. Um, a group of women from the uh, Voyagers Outward Bound School that would be directly impacted by the mine uh, towed a canoe via bike um, throughout Minnesota, crisscrossing the state, I think close to a thousand miles, if not more, stopping at communities and colleges and high schools along the way, giving presentations and educating people and bringing them into the campaign. And I thought to myself, I'm a hobbyist trail runner, uh, what can I do? So I came up with the idea of, of naming a new route through the wilderness called the Boundary Wars Traverse, which connected two iconic trails, uh, the Kekakabic Trail and the Border Route Trail, which meet in the middle uh, uh, right here for a total of 110 miles. And as much research and asking around as I could do, nobody had done this as one run uh, start to finish uh, without stopping. And so I thought this would be an amazing opportunity to do something for the first time, but then use it as an awareness advocacy tool for protecting the boundary waters. So I met with Claire uh, Gallagher, who's gonna come up next at the Winter OR show and pitch this idea. And she was immediately like, yes, let's do this. How can we help? So she got the Patagonia's trail running team on board. Um, and after two and a half years with a slight delay due to COVID, um, the project was underway. And they sent out Peyton Thomas, who is one of their, another one of their trail running uh, ambassadors. Uh, uh, Brennan Davis is an amazing photographer. Uh, he's, so, he's so good, uh, you should look him up. Um, he was out to document the, the, the journey. And then Claire, of course, Kyle Pietari, who's actually one of our pro bono lawyers and also an elite trail runner. Uh, joined along a friend from Minneapolis who manages a running store, uh, Matt Warda, and then Gren Murray Mayer. So Gren Murray is the town closest to the Boundary Waters on the eastern side of the wilderness, who's also a trail runner joined as well. So we broke this into segments. Claire's going to get a lot more into what the journey was like. Um, but we ran this as an advocacy effort, uh, finishing it in 38 hours, 15 minutes, and three seconds, to be precise. Uh, first, first person to do that. So that's, that's, that's really cool. Um, and here's kind of the team at the end. And I, <laughs> I'm looking tired because I was. So 
Uh, thank you again so much. Uh, I think we're gonna kick off just a, a one minute teaser trailer video. Uh, we had a film crew out documenting it. Uh, it's gonna, that's gonna come out hopefully this fall sometime soon, a uh, little bit longer form, but we'll do that. And then I'm gonna hand it over to Claire, uh, Claire Gallagher, who's gonna talk about the run and we'll go from there. So thank you again so much. I don't know if you can ever be ready for a 100 mile run. 80 to 90 miles of it is pure wilderness. I'm about as ready as I can be. The Banuars is just a, it's a place of quiet, natural solitude. You know, a giant sulfate or copper mine would pollute it forever. We got one chance to protect this place, and we can't mess it up. We've got to fight for it. This is a community where outdoor recreation is, is part of life here. I'm going to be running 110 miles through the heart of the Boundary Waters Wilderness as a way to draw attention to the issue of sulfate or copper mining and what could potentially happen to the wilderness. Thanks so much, Alex. Uh, who is ready to hunt, uh, run 100 miles now? I'm sure everyone's feeling pumped up this morning, this fine morning of Outdoor Retailer. My name is Claire Gallagher, and I had the pleasure of experiencing the Boundary Waters for the first time this past May. Uh, I've traveled all over the world for ultra marathons, advocacy trips, and coral reef research. And uh, I've known the Boundary Waters is special because I've been reading about it and hearing about it from people like Alex for the past few years. I have a lot of family in the Midwest. My 90-year-old grandfather, Pops, told me about spending five glorious weeks in the Boundary Waters and, quote, deep into Canada, living off fish and canned goods uh, more than 70 years ago when he lived in Milwaukee. So leading up to my trip here, I'm thinking, okay, this place can't be average if all these people are so hyped about it, right? And yet even still experiencing it firsthand surprised me. It is so pristine. Freshwater ecosystems are unique to me it, to begin with. I'm from the suburbs of Denver. I still live in Colorado and I used to study saltwater corals. So this world of lakes and loons and river otters, it, I knew it would all feel new, but it didn't just feel new. It felt like it was out of a novel. Thousands and thousands of lakes of all different sizes, shapes scattered throughout this swath of northern Minnesota and into Ontario, as Alex described. And all of these lakes are connected via the same water system, the Rainy River watershed. Here's Alex and fellow Patagonia trail running ambassador Peyton Thomas getting water straight from a lake on Alex's traverse. No filters necessary. This place is an ecological treasure trove to have such a large freshwater ecosystem still mostly intact from the impact of humans. So going back to when I first met Alex a few years ago, he almost immediately proposed this idea to run 100 miles across the Boundary Waters. And I'm like not convinced at the time that running across this land of lakes was even possible. But then I got a taste of the people who take the Boundary Waters logistics seriously. I don't know what it is. Maybe um, it's a Minnesota thing, a Midwest thing, but people truly think of everything. And, and the respect people have for this place um, is somewhat unparalleled to be perfectly honest. Like, of course, Alex had researched these trails. He he ran them multiple times in different smaller segments before attempting the full traverse. Uh, he had friends from the campaign paddle in three hours to give him aid in the middle of the traverse. And so in prepping for the trip and while out there, I was humbled by the dedication that people have to this place. And so the two trails that Alex ran essentially run across the Boundary Waters east to west. There's the Border Route Trail and the, that's just outside Grand Marais and the Kekabak Trail just outside Ely. 
And together they make up these 110 miles that are frankly, as you can see, the exact opposite of the smooth, buttery, buffed out trails that I know and love. Uh, these are Midwest trails. They're rocky, they're rooty. No hills are extremely big, but instead the miles tick by um, and you gain elevation and it feels kind of like death by a thousand cuts. Uh, it's hardcore trail running. Alex's route had over 18,000 feet of vertical elevation gain, which is uh, roughly the same as the Leadville Trail 100 mile run in Colorado. So getting into the run, I paced Alex for 30 miles in the heart of the wilderness. And to get to him, we had to paddle out with his wife, three kids, two dogs, two podcast producers in two canoes. So you can do that math. Uh, this family has big canoes. We paddled for about an hour, full steam, and our our timing was a little sketchy. We didn't want to be late for his expected time at this, quote, aid station, basically in the middle of nowhere on a map of lakes. And Erica, Alex's wife, she's the epitome of calm, but even she was like, he can't run this fast, right? And this is as we're tracking his GPS splits. Alex started off pretty hot on his run. And I'm usually pretty organized with splits and aid stations. I, I do these 100 mile runs relatively frequently and, and crew them, but I was all out of sorts in this paddle in. I was trying to figure out how many miles per hour we're paddling, how many miles per hour Alex is running. And I was just stunned though. like never in my life had I been in this, in a place so stunning, a lake um, that felt like it was in the middle of Eden. Uh, these pinnacle outcroppings overlooked the lake, black and white spruce trees and white cedars surrounded every visible slice of land around the lake. And this was a lake that turned out to be another lake, like it spilled into another lake. We passed through a narrow passage into this other lake, or maybe it was the same lake. I, I mean, I'm telling you, there's just, everything's a lake here. I didn't even know what we were doing at a certain point. And so anyways, we're still paddling hard, the kids, the dogs, the whole crew. And Erica's like, okay, he should come out over there, you know, pointing to essentially like one of those trees out there. And as we approach the shore, shore we see Alex, he had, he had beaten us and we're like, shoot, we're late. And he's like, no worries. So we just got here five minutes ago, you know, quintessential Midwestern Minnesota nice. Um, and mind you, he'd already run 25 miles at this point. So Alex got some food, said hey to his family. Um, I was scooping Nalgene's full of water directly from the lake, looking at Erica. And I'm like, really, this is okay to drink? She nodded and smiled like, yes, it's clean. And we took off straight into 90 degree heat for 30 miles together, um, along with photographer Brendan Davis. And I was immediately impressed with how cool the trail is. Like I've said, this is a world-class traverse, undulating hills, single track that's more like half track because it's so rarely used by humans. And the trees and the brush are so thick. And at a high point of our section together, overlooking a stunning collection of lakes, uh, Alex started to feel the miles a little bit, mostly in his stomach. Uh, nothing ultra runners aren't unaccustomed to. Um, after a quick sit down and throw up, he was back on his feet, chipper as ever. Um, we only cross paths with a few folks out, out in the wilderness. And they're, they're usually paddlers, um, you know, people, on canoe fly fishing or just camping. And to my surprise, Alex would stop every single time to tell these people what he was doing. It was the coolest campaigning I think I'll ever see in my entire life. He'd go, hey, I'm Alex, I'm out here running 100 miles. And they're like, what? <laughs> I'm trying to raise awareness about this sulfide or copper mine. Here are some campaign stickers. And he pulled out these campaign stickers in little Ziploc bags so that um, his sweat wouldn't contaminate them. And he said, you know, please contact your representatives and let's save this place. And he would be on his merry way. And I was just in awe. I mean, this place, this guy, his passion, these people who are so receptive and, and rightly so very alarmed. Um, some of them didn't know about the copper mine that was proposed. So in many ways, this win was or this run was already a win in my book. Um, things didn't stay perfectly cheery the whole way. Here's our uh, photographer, Brendan, who experienced the worst full blown uh 
Charlie horses in his quads that I've ever seen in my life. Unsure if he could keep going after sitting down, throwing up. Mind you, he ran collegiate track. Um, he miraculously recovered, which was good because we needed all the morale we could for the night. Um, as sunset turned into darkness, it poured torrentially for over an hour. And I'm like, Alex, is this even safe? Like, what are we doing? You know, and, and he, he looks around, he says, he's, he's like, no, we're good. It'll pass. And lo and behold, he was right. The rain passed and, um, we are already soaked and just got more and more wet touching every single leaf on the trail that was also soaked. Um, it's a very wet place after it rains. And we stopped talking much after midnight. We are so hell-bent on getting to the next aid station with Erica and Peyton, who take over pacing the next section. So it was quiet, uh, except for these loon calls. And hearing loons at night in the Boundary Waters might be one of my most favorite sounds. Um, these are some really, really happy loons. 6 a.m. eventually rolled around. Alex is 65 miles in at this point, and he was not so happy. <laughs> uh, thankfully, we had some new crew members, Boundary Waters pro bono lawyer, Kyle Piatari, who's also an ultra runner, stopped to force feed Alex while he's swathed in this ducky blanket. And his, his kids are looking on like, you know, kind of in horror, like what has happened to our dad? And, and we're all kind of like, Yep, advocacy can be this hard. <laughs> and 40 miles after that, Alex in beautiful form, super impressive athletic feat, uh, finished the run in 38, mi 38 hours and change, accompanied by here's Kyle on the left and Matt Wardha on the right. And of course, his family. Uh, this is such a place of family. I left this place with a full heart, a tired body, and eager to return to its pristineness. I feel so, so strongly that we must permanently protect this place. And thankfully, we have more advocates um, all over, uh, like our next speaker, Joseph Goldstein, who is the founder of Kids for the Boundary Waters. He's been paddling the Boundary Waters since he was six years old. He's been working with the campaign to save the Boundary Waters since he was 13. He has an incredible story. He grew up on a small farm in Illinois and currently attends Middlebury, where he's studying molecular, molecular biology and biochemistry. So take it away, Joseph. Thank you, Claire. Uh, let me just share my screen here. Um, share and then go into the presenter view. Cool. Um, so, oh, sorry, my preferences are popping up on my screen here. One sec. All right. Um, so I'm Joseph, uh, and today I'm going to talk to you a bit about my story and how I formed the organization Kids for the Boundary Waters. Uh, kids for the Boundary Waters is an organization run by kids for kids who know and love the Boundary Waters and want to protect the special wilderness. Um, so in order to tell you about this, I'm going to kind of run through the past 15 years of my life in the next 10 minutes um, and tell you about my connection to the Boundary Waters. And I am sitting outside next to a lake, kind of right outside Boundary Waters. So I may get interrupted by one of those loons everybody keeps talking about. Um, so my first trip to the BWCA was the summer when I was six. Um, I often describe the feeling of that first trip as the feeling of coming home. Um, being in the wilderness affected me that deeply. I fell in love with everything about it. Um, the paddling, camping, fishing, swimming, the quiet, the stars at night. Um, even the portaging, I liked that even as a little kid. Um, everything about being in the wilderness affected me in ways that are hard to describe, but um, that everybody um, who's here today has done a pretty good job of articulating and anyone who has spent much time in the outdoors definitely understands. Every year we made the trip back, sometimes a couple times a year. We made friends up there. We added brothers to my family. Um, and they, love, they love the wilderness just as much as I do. Um, summers pretty soon weren't enough for us, so we started coming during the fall and winter too. 
um, those dog sledding trips um, put a hunger for adventure in me that led me to other places. Um, I kind of like to describe the Boundary Waters as a gateway drug for um, wilderness adventures. Uh, and over the course of my life, I've been fortunate en enough to travel to wild places all over the world, including in the Arctic. Um, but no matter where I've gone, the Boundary Waters has remained home to me. Um, and then in the fall of 2014, um, the fall of my eighth grade year, I was 13 years old, all my travels kind of came to a halt. Um, my mom noticed some unusual bruising on my arms and legs and her being the doctor that she is, she pulled me out of class one day um, and took me in for some blood work at the local clinic. And a couple hours later, I was in the pediatric ICU at the Children's Hospital. Um, I was diagnosed with high-risk leukemia, and my doctors told me that I'd essentially be on lockdown for the next three and a half years um, while I took my daily chemotherapy treatments. Um, and as you can imagine, that was pretty hard news to take. Uh, we canceled our winter travel plans, and rather than wait around for my hair to start falling out, um, I had a big head shaving party with all my friends. Um, they all shaved their heads along with me. Uh, so did my little brothers. Um, my little brother Jonah looks awful with a shaved head. I hope he never does it again. Um, but we, we worked really hard to keep um, spirits high despite my cancer diagnosis. Um, and then a week or so after my diagnosis, this thing happened that I wasn't really expecting. Um, I got a visit from uh, the Make-A-Wish Foundation at the hospital. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, Make-A-Wish is an organization that grants wishes to critically or terminally ill kids, and they came to tell me that my diagnosis qualified me um, to have a wish granted. They talked about other wishes they'd granted for um, kids, um, trips uh, to Disneyland, visits with famous people, um, swimming pools in the backyard, um, even a pony, at which point I thought my mom was going to lose it. Um, and I was pretty taken aback by this. Um, and I, I, I told him I'd take some time to think about it. I didn't want to make a hasty decision. Um, and then on the way home from the hospital that day, it, it kind of hit me. Um, that previous summer, um, we were up for our, our annual family trip in the Boundary Waters. Um, I learned about um, plans to build a copper mine directly on the border of the Boundary Waters. Um, the place I love most, um, whose memories I'd been returning to for strength throughout my chemotherapy treatments, um, was under a pretty direct threat from this proposed mine. And uh, that's when I knew um, exactly what I wanted to wish for. Um, I wanted to wish to permanently protect the Boundary Waters and to stop this mine from being built. Um, Unfortunately, the Make-A-Wish Foundation um, wasn't able to help me with my wish. Um, they tried to figure out a way that they could, but due to its political nature, there was nothing they could do um, without risking losing their nonprofit status. Um, so I decided that if I wanted to um, Save the Boundary Waters, I was going to have to do um, I got connected with the campaign Save the Boundary Waters chemotherapy. I had a one-week break in treatments. I took that week, and I drove to Washington, D.C. Um, to make speeches and meet with lawmakers and policymakers. Um, I talked to everyone I could, fighting to stop this mine from happening. Um, I was reminding them that wilderness needs our protection um, and telling them that us kids have a huge interest and stake in the decisions that they were making. Um, it was not okay for them to sell off our wilderness to foreign mining interests for short-term profit. Um, and after all, who can say no to a kid with cancer? As it turns out, a lot of people could, not her, um, she's great. Um, but I didn't let that deter me. And over the next three years, I continued to visit the Boundary Waters um, as often as possible. Um, and also I kept traveling back to DC again and again and again um, to meet with policymakers and to make speeches about the Boundary Waters um, pretty much wherever and whenever I could. Um, and in November of 2017, I took another trip to DC. Um, 
and at that time it really felt like we were fighting a um a hard uphill battle um i met with congressman davis who is my district rep um to discuss an upcoming bill um hr 3905 which is also known as the emmer bill um it's a pretty nasty piece of anti-wilderness legislation that was going to be particularly harmful to the boundary waters um I spent a lot of time going over the maps, the science, the polling data, um, the bill, um, and you know, telling stories about the boundary waters as well. Um, but in the end, the the bill was passed through the House, and excuse me, Congressman Davis voted yes um, along party lines, despite everything um, we'd done to convince him otherwise. Um, he actually called me the night of the vote on my cell phone to try and explain his vote. Um, but it was, it was pretty clear that he, he either didn't understand or more likely he didn't want to understand what was at stake. And I was, uh, I was pretty demoralized by this defeat. But inspiration comes from strange places. Um, a couple weeks after the vote, my friend Tommy called me and asked what he could do. He wanted me to send him a PowerPoint presentation and some notes so that he could start teaching kids at his school in St. Louis about the issue. Um, and this was, this was right around the time that I was finally finishing up my, my fourth year of chemotherapy. Um, and I was kind of closing that, closing the door on that stage of my life. Um, and I decided it was time for me to kind of start the next stage of my fight for the Boundary Waters. And, and that's where I came up with this new project. Um, that's how Kids for the Boundary Waters was born. Uh, I started thinking about how important it is for kids to know how to effectively communicate with our lawmakers. Um, that our voices matter a lot because we're going to inherit whatever left mess they leave to us. Um, we have an important stake in protecting America's wildernesses and all the world's wildernesses for ourselves and for the generations that come after. Um, and I think we can have a huge impact on what happens. Um, and that's where we really hope kids for the Boundary Waters um, can begin to help out. Since our launch in 2018, um, Kids, um, Kids for the Boundary Waters has hosted three advocacy fly-ins to uh, DC. Over the course of those fly-ins, we've taken about 130 kids from around the world um, to Washington. Um, and we've taken over 120 meetings with high-ranking officials at the Departments of Interior, Agriculture, the Bureau of Land Management, the Forest Service, and um, with members of Congress as well. Um, we did have a fourth fly-in plan for last summer with over 100 participants scheduled to come into DC with us. Um, but uh, of course, for the same reason that I'm, I'm talking to you over the computer, um, that wasn't able to happen. Um, following our first fly-in though, uh, we had excerpts from letters we had written were read on the house floor during debate. Um, and during our most recent trip to DC, we were labeled by Congressman uh, Dean Phillips of Minnesota's third district as the most effective lobbying group in DC. Um, I can't really say it enough. Uh, our voices matter a lot. Um, for this to work though, we need, uh, we need to grow. We need a whole generation um, of youth who understand the power of effective advocacy and know how to do it. Um, and that's really the goal of Kids for the Boundary Waters. We're gonna fight as long and as hard as we can to protect the boundary waters, but ultimately we um, hope to have inspired and taught a whole lot of youth how to use their voices effectively um, to advocate for wild spaces throughout America or even more broadly for other issues that they are passionate about. Um, and throughout my time working um, with the campaign and Kids for the Boundary Waters, um, I've really noticed a few things in particular. Um, the first is the power of storytelling. Uh, you can know every single fact about water quality, about wilderness edge mining economies, um, about outdoor uh, recreation economies, um, about the chemistry of what happens when mine tailings leach into surrounding waters and any other sort of factual information rate related to this mine. And you can share all of it with every lawmaker you meet with. Um, but it's hardly as effective as the connection that comes from regaling a personal tale from time spent in the wilderness. Uh, and that's not to say that facts and data aren't important in these fights. They are, and extremely so. Um, but usually the moment you step, into some, step out of someone's office, 
um, they'll forget everything you told them. But what they're not going to forget is uh, how you made them feel about what you told them. Second is the efficacy of youth advocacy work. Um, us young people, I think, um, are taken a little bit more seriously, um, to be honest, um, than you adults are um, when it comes to convincing lawmakers. Um, and to be honest, I'm, I'm still not entirely sure why um, that is. Uh, it could be that they're looking for job security since they know we're the ones who will be um, increasingly voting them in or out of office. Um, maybe they're generally concerned uh, for our futures um, or uh, it's possibly just because we're so damn cute. Um, like I said, I'm not, I'm not quite sure why um, youth are quite so effective um, in advocacy, um, but we are. And if I had to guess, it's probably some kind of combination um, of all those reasons. Um, and finally, probably most importantly, um, I've learned that fights like these really are a long game. Um, and that's, that's really the test. Um, are you willing to plant your feet in your valleys and defend the things that matter over and over and over, uh, recognizing that um, you'll have to suit up, show up and repeat, even when all the work you've done gets undone. And we even, even when other things are competing for your time, uh, Many of the issues we care most about go on to be fights of a lifetime. Um, I have friends who've been protecting the boundary waters in one way or another since before I, my mom was born. Um, the long game is just that, it's, it's long. Uh, wilderness is important for its own sake. It's up to all of us to recognize the importance that the boundary waters holds, um, that other wild, excuse me, wild spaces hold as well, um, and to safeguard them because they can't defend themselves. Everyone who has ever fallen in love with, uh, found peace and healing in, or made their living um, on these waters is counting on you and me to do this. People who haven't yet set foot here, who have never experienced the joy of a walleye pulled from the lake, or listened to the call of a loon at sunset, or experienced the peace of a paddle steadily dipping into these waters, um, they're counting on you and me too, uh, and they don't even know it yet. We can't let them down, and we can't let the wilderness down. Um, Thank you so much for your time. I'm going to hand it back over to Brady. If I can figure out how to stop my share. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, thank you for that presentation. Thank you for that incredible story and everything that you've done to protect this place. I want to thank all of our speakers, Alex and Claire. Um, you know, as I mentioned, this, this landscape had a huge impact on me. It had a huge impact on all of our speakers. I'm sure there's a number of wild places that everyone watching our presentation today can reflect back on that had a huge impact on you. And this is a moment right now where we as a community need to act. You know, I think it's interesting that kids just get it. I explained to my daughter this morning uh, what daddy was gonna be doing. And uh, with no prompting, she um, drew on a paper towel uh, a, a dollar bill with a line through it and a picture of someone enjoying some beautiful water. And uh, the caption reads, money can't buy anything better for you than fresh water. And uh, I, think, I think that's true, obviously. Uh, just to be clear, we need copper. Uh, as a society, I'm speaking to you on a computer that's full of copper and all kinds of rare earth elements right now, but we don't need this mine. And this mine is based on a false narrative that we need to destroy nature to create jobs and to promote economic vitality. I think anyone who takes a look at this seriously and looks at the long view would agree that it is not in the public interest to destroy this place so that we can extract ore and ultimately those profits go to a foreign company at Fagusta. Just think about that destroying a pristine wilderness so that a foreign company can reap the profits. So if you agree with everyone on this uh, presentation today, that this is a gross miscarriage of the public interest and that we need to stand up and protect this place, there's something you can do. I'd like you to grab your cell phone right now 
and uh, open up your Messenger app and uh, send a text to 40649, text 40649. And in the body of the text, uh, just type in uh, save BWCA, save BWCA, all one word. And what's going to happen is um, a little, uh, you'll get a little response and you click on that link and it's going to take you to a letter writing tool. And this tool will allow you to just enter in a little bit of information. Uh, and then there's a body of the message and you can edit that and put in, you, you should frankly put in some of your own words if you like, but this will automatically send a message to your representatives to support uh, Representative McCollum's bill, HR 2794, the Boundary Waters Protection and Pollution Protection Act. It's really important that your representatives know that you're paying attention, that we're paying attention to this issue and that the protection of wild places is important to us. So please do that and do that right now. It's something very easy that you can do to help support this effort. Another thing I'd ask is that you go. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, I think the Boundary Waters Canoe Area is one of the uh, unheralded and unknown gems of our public land system in the United States. Uh, go fly into Minneapolis, drive north. You can fly into Duluth if you want. Uh, find an outfitter who can help you out with some equipment and go in and bear witness. And for goodness sake, if you have kids, bring them to obviously exposing children to wild places in the wilderness can have a huge impact as we saw today with Joseph's work. So those are two ideas uh, for things you can do to help support this campaign. I wanna thank all of you for tuning in, for taking time to watch this. I wanna thank all of our members uh, this has been a difficult economic uh, period, to say the least, a difficult time to run a business. And for all of you who've stayed with us and continued to support our work and continued to pay your membership dues so we could pass those dollars along to our grantees, I want to say a big thank you. And I hope that you all enjoy the show. See ya.